Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm here with uh, a really cool guy. His name's Ren. Uh, how are you doing today? Fine, thank you. Um, it's been a great experience. A great experience in what? To see all the people get together to stand up for what they should be standing up for. And that's the Constitution and our country of freedom. Today we went to the Alamo and had a, a large open carry demonstration. And uh, Ren joined the crowd. But you also did something else here recently that was that was pretty interesting. Before I get to that, I, I want to ask you about your military experience. Where, what, what have you done in the military? What have I done? I started in New Guinea. Went from New Guinea to Leyte. In Leyte, we were used as ground forces, and went back into the jungles. The officers didn't protect our rear. Japanese took over. We were trapped for five and a half days without food or water. And we kept trying to take the hill behind us every day, and every day more would die. I spent two nights in a foxhole when we did get that hill, still fighting down the line here, and water to my hips. And the terrible thing about that was to spend there the night in the dark and hear some soldier that had been mortally wounded saying, Mama, Mama. That was terrible. Nothing you could do about it. So, World War II, Pacific, the Pacific Front. Uh, how old are you? I'll be 91 Thanksgiving Day. 91 Thanksgiving Day. It's amazing. You know what's amazing to me is that you went up against a, a tyrannical force in World War II, and in my opinion, you did hear recently also when you went to Washington, D.C. And you went and helped tear down the memorial barricades at the World War II memorial. Yes. Why did you do that? Stuart Rhodes and me, he, I think he probably arranged it for me to go on an honor flight last September. And he went back there with me on his honor flight. And I really didn't care that much about going. Because I didn't want to go back to the, and I didn't want to fly, and I didn't want to go back to Washington, D.C. But it became one of the highlights of my life. And when I found out what was happening, and Stuart offered again to take me there. It's time that I wake up and that I take a stand against what I believe in. I don't care what the cost is. And I had decided that with Stuart, but I think I told him. I, I, I called my daughter and said, there's always a possibility that we can be killed on something like this if the police go against us. I said, I want you to know this is the way I want to go out, fighting for what I believe in. I think that's so amazing because uh, from my point of view, I think that the generation that you're a part of uh, did a lot to stand against Hitler, to, to stand against the, the Japanese and what was happening. And then as there are a lot of control measures coming down upon our nation, and in my opinion, it, it looks like pre-World War II Germany in America right now. And, uh, and you're out there at 90 years old doing what a lot of men won't do. And I've got a lot of mad respect for that. Um, and now you're here at the Alamo today. How, how was the Alamo today? Fantastic. Did you see a lot of patriots out there? I sure did. Uh, probably one of the biggest thrills that, that I'll remember is when I read the Pledge of Allegiance. And here the crowd, everybody, they wasn't whispering it, they were shouting it like they believed it and like they're, they're going to do it. Remember the Constitution and do what's necessary to stand up for it and make sure our country follows the Constitution and the people in it. Why have you given 80 to 90 years of your life 
to your country and the Constitution and to America. What has driven you to make a lot of your actions in fighting for our people here? What is that? I was born in a time of independence and self-sufficiency. And I see today a society of dependent people. They depend upon the government for handouts. They depend upon somebody to do the things for them. And they better wake up and become back independent and take back the Constitution. Our country is being taken from us just like you did an elephant, one bite at a time. And it's, it's pitiful. Uh, I have a hard time rationalizing how people can set and see what's happening to their country and I try to talk to them. It's like their mind has gone blank. And the conclusion uh, my personal self would come to that the water, our food, everything must be polluted, poisoned, and to dumb us down. Because this country, when you take this country as young as it is, and become the greatest country on the face of this earth that was willing to help anybody, any place, any time, and see what's happened to us today when we're being totally controlled and letting it happen. My heart breaks when I think of these young kids here coming on. I've got granddaughters and I've got their, my great grandkids and I see no future for them. And I think one of the reasons today that we have this, the youth, a lot of it be using drugs. I can understand it because they can't see a future. So they dumb their brain down so they can live with it. If they want to go to get a college education, what do they do? They have to put a monkey on their back immediately and borrow money from the government. How are they going to t get married, buy a home, and start a family? Under those conditions, when they start off, I have no idea from 20 to depending upon the profession you're going into, how much you're going to owe. The future is sad, and if the people don't wake up, they're going to see what I saw. Are you willing to talk about what you saw? I what? <laughs> it chokes me up a little. It's terrible to see young little boys and young little girls with legs like this. Where did you see them like that? Where did I see them? Through the, the Philippines. And trying to find anything to eat, get it, going through garbage, going through anything to find anything to eat. And I see that happening here to the children here. And who's to blame? We all are. As their parents are setting, letting these things happen. And like I've said, I said earlier today, most people are capture of this, I'll say it again, of the stinking government and the TV. They've been captured by those two. And they don't realize it, I guess, because they're not taking a stand. I don't care if it costs them their life. I don't care if it costs me my life. It's time to take a stand and take our country back. Don't ask me how we can do it. I alone or all of us here cannot do it. But I told Stuart we need masses of people to, be, to stand up to take our country back. Now one of the things that, um, that people equate with what's going on in America now is the fact that the government might actually become a force against the people and even imprison them and I've heard about you that um, that you actually helped free people that were that were in a internment camp like situation are you willing to talk about that yes we were in a combat zone we weren't fighting at that time particularly and I 
believe, if I remember correctly, it was a Filipino escape from the, from the Los Banos prison camp. That was south of Manila at Luzon. He came in and said, the next morning at 7 o'clock, they was going to start shooting all the prisoners. There was 2,146 men, women, and children in that camp. Wow. And so we didn't have time to reconnoiter or anything else, and the pilots didn't have flew us over. And we loaded in planes, and at exactly 7 o'clock, I say, we hit the silk and jumped out over the prison camp, right at the entrance. That's where we jumped out. And we took over the camp. And we got all 2,146 prisoners released. There was a lake about a half a mile from there. And we walked them to the lake, walked and carried, and they brought amphibs in from the, over the other side and picked them up and took them out. And one lady got shot through the stomach. Not a serious accident, that was the only one hurt. And none of us got hurt. But there was a lot of others who did. didn't make it out of there. They were the enemy. They stayed there, <coughs> as they should. Uh, an interesting thing, General Yamashita, one of the big generals in Japan, must have had something to do with that prison camp. And after World War II, when they had the trials, General Yamashita was sentenced, tried and sentenced to hang. And an interesting thing, and I didn't realize this till a year or two ago, he was hung in the Los Banos prison camp. And General Colin Powell, is that correct? General Colin Powell said this is probably one of the greatest rescuers there's ever been, would probably be used throughout history of an example of making rescues. And it was when you figure the amount of people we got out of there without anybody being hurt. And it was Company B in the 11th Parachute Regiment, 11th Airborne Division. They called on us because I don't know whether I should say it or not. I think that was the reason why they picked on us. We didn't take prisoners. And when the Japanese would make a bad guy attack at night screaming and hollering, none of Company B would return fire on them till they were close enough to our foxhole that after they were shot, we could make sure they were dead. So I think that might have been one of the reasons why we were picked, that we were fighter, fighters and we tooth, got the job done. Tooth and nail. Pardon? Tooth and nail. Tooth and nail. You, you did what it took. And I would do it again. How can, how can anybody set and see and know that there's all those people going to be killed? Now, I got a letter from one of the men last year that sent a letter. He said, I would not be here except if it wasn't for you getting my grandfather released. Wow. Him and his family. A lot of experiences. You want to hear more? Always. I can hear this stuff all day long. I was in a rest camp. And I woke up at night knowing I was going to be killed. And some of the men in the tent, when I told them, they said, well, check yourself into the hospital. I said, no. They said, I said, if, if my number's up, it's up, no matter where I'm at. And we were froze to quarters. We told them we were going to have to jump behind enemy lines in northern Luzon. And I can't remember for sure, but it seems like they said there was 30,000 troops that we were going to jump behind and hold till the 37th Division came in overland and relieved us. Don't ask me how I was going to be the first man out of the plane. I was setting, riding the plane up to this combat area. I went to sleep. I woke up, 
walked to the door, stood in the door and looked out, and the feeling was gone. Wow. That I was, I, everything was going to be all right. When the green light come on and I was supposed to jump, I hit an air, the plane hit an air pocket, threw me across the plane in a heap. The rest of the men got out. When I got up again and went to the door and went to jump out, hit another air pocket, they threw me out head first. I went down when the chute snapped open and spun my feet around and hooked them in my suspension lines and I couldn't get them out. I'm making a combat jump into enemy territory <laughs> with my and landing on my head. Wow. <laughs> When you never believed it. The field was rice paddy and was bare as this floor. But on the outer perimeter was still the dishes with rice and stuff in the Japanese had been eating their breakfast wow. and disappeared. I didn't find till I think it was eight years ago. And I had talked, they'd asked me to talk at church about patriotism and I told about that. And I said, to this day, they don't know what happened to all of those troops where they disappeared to. And a lot of people looked at me, and I could read. They think, well, this guy's full of baldy, you know. And <coughs> that fall, I cannot remember whether it was through the paper or television or what it was. They told about what happened. General Yamashita had written the article. When they left there, they went to, and I don't remember the figure, seven or nine caves with all those groups that they had these caves. They stayed there for, I don't remember what the length of time was. In these caves was multi billions of dollars worth of gold, silver, jewels the richest collection, they'd all been collected there. And the general said they went out, him and his office, some of his officers, and they sealed all, they got, they had a party and got half of them drunk, sealed all the caves closed. So they're still sealed today? They, pardon? They're still sealed to this day? They, no. They got a hold of General Yamashita, that our troops are cut, country uh, officers or whoever was in charge of that got a hold of General Yamashita's driver of his car and made him tell and show him where these caves were. They went back, our country did, they went back and got all the jewels and, and the last I'd ever been able to trace on that, they were coming to Germany back to the United States whatever happened from that point on, but it was literally, literally, I guess, unbelievable amounts of money and jewels and gold and silver and everything else in there. One more to those stories of all the hidden gold and silver and treasure that we keep trying to hear about. One more thing before we, before we end the video. <clears throat> you, uh, you sound like a man that has continued to research the things that you've been a part of in your life and uh, you sound very sound of mind. And with all of your wisdom of the years that you've lived here in this place and the things that you've been through, what would you tell the 20-year-olds and the 30-year-olds and the 40-year-olds who now are, are standing up against things and are preaching freedom in our own country so that we don't see those things here in America? What would you say to those people? What would your wisdom say to those people? Probably what I said this morning, number one, turn off the dumb television and start doing research. I do, I do lots of research. I spend hours and hours putting her every day researching on the computer. And I just got me a new Windows 8, and I'm ten times as dumb as that thing is. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I don't care what the cost, I've got to stop and rephrase this a little bit. Would I advise young men to join the military today? No. Would I advise them to research, study, and do the exercise, eat properly, 
let drugs alone and become strong where they can take care of themselves and make up their mind they don't care what the cost is they're going to take this country back and put it under the Constitution whatever the cost to them death is nothing freedom is everything Hallelujah. so if you can't have freedom why live I, I am I just have a run, I'm still having a run-in with the government and they interviewed me two weeks ago in the paper because they they want to get me contempt of court I moved back in my home after they told me I had to move out which I didn't shouldn't have <laughs> and I said in the paper I'll never leave my home again if I leave it'll be feet first or in cuffs and if they want to put me in cuffs I don't think I'll go alone I have a lot of respect uh, for you, Ren. Uh, thank you so much for being with us at the Alamo today. And a lifetime of patriotism and servant to freedom. That is so amazing to me, and uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you for having the opportunity to tell you about it. you got to ask him <clears throat> what he thinks about what's happened to our dollar. He's seen over 90 years the devaluation of the U.S. dollar, what the Federal Reserve has done to this country. You should ask him about that. He can give you a perspective no one else really has. Where's our country gone with inflation and, and, uh, and the, the American dollar? I think it's going to crash. Right now it isn't worth hardly anything. Back to when I was a young man, um, I started off when I left a farm in Minnesota and went to Los Angeles and I worked as a bus boy and a dollar an hour was big money if you had a, if you had a good position. I didn't get that as a bus boy but I worked in the shipyard after that and a dollar an hour is big money. But that dollar an hour would buy you way more than today. And what a dollar would, or five dollars or ten dollars. The money is almost worthless when it's the cost of everything today. Look at what the food costs. And it gets higher every day. Uh, when I went to California in 1941, with my, my parents moved out and left the dairy farm and sold out. We bought a new th three bedroom, two car garage corner lot in Los Angeles. Next September of 1941. You'd never guess the price. $5,000. $3,200. So wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Just because it's a new year doesn't mean that things cost more? No, I don't think things are costing more. The dollar is worthless almost. And when they get done with it, it's going to be worthless. I expect that to happen on a daily basis. What can we do uh, as Americans uh, all, across, all across the country to be prepared for that? What can we do to be prepared for that? Well, I guess you, one of the main things you could do, because you're not going to be able to buy the food in the grocery store, if it's there you won't have the money. I would suggest they do what I did. I went and bought all the makings for a 20 by 32 foot greenhouse. And I start, I, and it, it, it's in the freezing cold I found a way that you can start tomatoes in March. So you're eating tomatoes in June and all the food and then put up your own food, grow your own beef, milk your own cow. If you can't have a cow in most cases you can't get goats. That's what I did. Fantastic. Excellent food. Healthy. Be prepared to be self-sufficient. Thanks again, Ren. I really appreciate your time uh, and and your lifetime of, of service for freedom in, in America. Uh, 
I hope that, that one day I can stand up to the same thing. Until next time, everybody. Bye. Thank you.